Sadiq Hassan was one of those who called themselves the Ahle Hadith, the people of the prophetic traditions, who argued like reformers in the late 19th century across religious traditions that were across uh, competing sects, that adherence to original texts newly available in print and translation were the route to spiritual and worldly renewal. The Ahle Hadith were also millenarian, a perspective adding urgency to their teaching. And they offered this additional cachet of being part of a large transnational world of Arabic language and learning. This made it easy for opponents to label them Wahhabi. Then, as now, a term meant to conjure up fanaticism and a bent to violence. If the energetic pursuit of an Islamic reform agenda was the making of Sadiq Hassan, a range of Islamic projects were central to Shah Jahan Begum's life in these years as well. Her most visible program as a ruler consisted of extensive undertakings in urban planning and architecture, making her arguably the most active woman patron of architecture in India ever. Much of this was not Islamic at all, not least the railways that integrated Bhopal with British India by the 1880s, and she built many of the structures that any progressive modern prince would build. She established printing presses, schools, orphanage, hospital, post offices, official guest houses, and so forth. But some of the building, the most interesting buildings in many ways, uh, were Muslim. Uh, and these buildings were designed in what can be called a Mughal revival style. Uh, Shah Jahan's own unusual name evokes the Mughal Empire as well. She's one of the emperors and her father was Jahangir. All of this resonant of India's great imperial past. Now, that may seem a kind of obvious thing to do, but it is not at all. Embracing Mughal symbols for the Bhopalis, and I'm only slightly exaggerating, was essentially as new as building railways. Patans had routinely challenged Mughal rule. So why now? At the height of the Mughal Empire, Hindu Rajputs, for example, um, in service to the Mughals, had done so, had built, for example, in a shared architectural style as a sign of cultivation and participation in the ruling elite. For them, Mughal symbols offered a claim on grandeur. And that was true, that was the part of the Bhopali uh, motive as well. There's another dimension of this, I would argue, too, and that is by taking on a Mughal aura, the Bhopalis located themselves in an all India context. They'd been a regional power. And this was a period in which a national stage was emerging, not least one experienced and represented by the princes themselves. But Mughal symbols also marked the regime as Muslim. Not the case at the height of the empire, say for the Rajputs, but now, by the late 19th century, Mughal was increasingly conflated with Muslim as part of colonialist and emerging nationalist histories alike. And princely rulers were expected to represent their religion in a colonial sociology that defined states according to the religion of the ruler. And Shah Jahan well, enthusiastically took on a Mughal style. She built her own Shah Jahanabad, region of the city, just like Mughal Delhi. She named her vast palace complex the Taj Mahal. And in her mosques, graves, and Eidgah, the political program and the Islamic program met. Towering over the city was the Taj al Masajid the second of two mosques of this period, uh, both of them modeled on Delhi's celebrated congregational mosque, the Jama Masjid. 
the Taj al-Masajid is often counted as the largest mosque in Asia. One particular feature, fascinating feature of the mosque, which is also replicated in her vast Eidgah, prayer, this is a prayer ground north of the city, was a dedicated area for women in each running front to back. This was an unheard of design element in South Asian mosques or Eidgahs, but cohered with al teaching that favored women's public prayer. And graves were built in accord with the teaching that only dirt, no built structure should cover the body. So in these ways, Shah Jahan asserted in stone not only that she was a pious ruler, but that she was part of new trends in religious thought and practice. And she presented this image in words. She studied the volumes of Hadith. She copied with her own hand the great Indian reformist tract of mid-century, the Takvir al-Iman. She published a collection of Hadith of her own selection. And I also would include in this one of her more unusual, in this collection of the books that, that represent this new orientation, a dictionary, a very unusual kind of book, um, multilingual listing of Urdu terms alphabetically um, with equivalence in multiple languages. And some of the definitions were given a reformist bent. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, the Urdu word randi is the usual word used for widow and prostitute. Widows are uncontrolled, prostitute, the, the, were, the meaning slides easily from one to the other. And what equivalent, that's the, the definition you would find in a standard Urdu dictionary. What does she do? Under the Persian column, zan. Under the Sanskrit column, stri. Under the English column, a woman. So she has, by her definitions, removed, if you will, the stigma from widowhood. Now, most important of these publications uh, was 1883, a manual on women's behavior, wholly unprecedented project for a woman in Urdu publishing at this point, from birth to death, covering everything from medical advice to correct ritual practice, all bolstered by scriptural quotation. And throughout, she emphasized the importance of women saving themselves and their families from dependence. By following this kind of, if you will, divinely inspired teaching, practical teaching, worldly teaching, as well as religious teaching. And I was quite taken with the way she wrote at great length on exercise and horsemanship. All of the family were very active, um, horseback riders. But the horse gloss, I think, is an interesting angle on this theme of, of uh, women's, if you will, self-sufficiency. To be sure, she writes, elephant, ruling may elephant riding may have its glory, but the person on an elephant is completely powerless in the hands of the mahout. In Ahle Hadith teachings, Shah Jahan had found an arena for independence, achievement, and moral certainty, apart from the controlling hand of formidable family members like her mother and vigilant colonial officials alike. Key to this program was nothing other than her decision to retire into Perda, a practice she had earlier resented. How do we explain this? Her opponents said her seclusion was part of Sadiq Hassan's control and trying to grab power for himself. Later, hi historians have routinely attributed her behavior to a fluke of personality, that mother and grandmother had been these tough women, but she was more feminine uh, than her, her forebears. I think that misses something. It misses the way the times had changed. The woman question had become a major theme among reformers of all religious backgrounds in the face of critiques on the part of colonial officials and others, in part. Women, now in theory saved from the colonized world, came to be assigned the novel role of being the guardians and transmitters of an endangered heritage. As such, 
and this is very interesting for both modernists and traditionalists, girls had to be educated. But, or and at the same time, lest education mislead them, they had to embrace modesty and devotion to domestic duties. Part of being a new style Muslim woman was to be both educated and in Purda. So given these new themes in public life, it would not have served Shah Jahan Begum like her mother to operate as a male. How could an educated woman, let alone one acting as a ruler and a published author, remain respectable? Previously, the educated and cultured woman most likely to speak in mixed settings, to publish their poetry or to disseminate their poetry and interact with unrelated men, were courtesans. Purda was key. And outside the home, the burqa provided respectability as it would for later generations seeking university education or export-oriented factory work. None of the colonial officials liked the practice. And Shah Jahan did show some flexibility. She decided that sh this was appropriate behavior. She sought colonial permission. She put off the practice until she had gone to Bombay in 1873 to be initiated into this order of the Star of India. Um, I'm giving as an example her trip to Calcutta here in this image in 1876 on the occasion of the visit of the Prince of Wales. And as you can see, she remained very heavily covered in a public setting. This is a drawing in a London newspaper. Um, but then in a personal visit with the prince, she appeared, I would say, like any respectable woman of the day with a sari palu or a scarf over her head. Probably she had a light veiling over her face. The, journals, the journalists traveling with the prince simply reported that the Begum chatted away amicably on this occasion. <laughs> and for the viceregal visit to Bhopal in 1891, as a compliment to her distinguished guests, Her Highness came out of Purda during their visit. Lord Lansdowne wrote to his mother that the Begum, quote, young for her age at 52, was not disagreeable to look at. Now, covering had its advantages beyond avoiding judgments like these. Above all, like the marriage, it was understood to be at God's order and thus was part of the fashioning of a pious self that Shah Jahan aspired to. Her adoption of Purda was empowering in a worldly sense as well, not only as I've just been describing as securing social respectability, power in another way. Shah Jahan could see her male interlocutors, but they could not see her. And that surely is one of the reasons that our Sir Lepel Griffin hated her seclusion so much. And it was Lepel Griffin, the, who was the figure who, who precipitated Bhopal's crisis. A competition walla, he had entered the elite Indian civil service in 1860 through examination. Griffin cut a dramatic swath through colonial society. As the DNB put it in 1912, shortly after he died, Griffin was a dandyish, Byronic figure, articulate, argumentative, and witty, a man of languid foppishness and irreverent tongue, as well as an overt disdain for modesty. By the late 1870s, Griffin's brilliance had earned him appointment as Chief Secretary of the Punjab. He even appeared as a slightly disguised character in a popular Raj novel, the Chronicles of Dusty Poor, put it on your reading list, very entertaining. In 1880, he got the opportunity of a lifetime, and this is a reflection of the fact that for all his flamboyance, he was an extraordinarily effective civil servant in many ways. In 1880, the Viceroy entrusted him with the great moment of his career, solving the disastrous aftermath of the Second Afghan War.